So we're looking at the Hikarangi Magnitude 9 uh, in specific detail, particularly for uh, Gisborne City. Um, obviously it's a multi-regional planning activity. Uh, specifically for us we've got a very regional focus and within that regional focus is the urban built up area for Gisborne, for the city itself. The few days that we've got here is about how we get our community ready for a magnitude event that we know will cause severe destruction to Tairawhiti and I use that word deliberately. We're looking at an event where we know we'll lose a lot of our roads, we'll lose a lot of buildings, um, planning for what are, unfortunately um, loss of life, those things and making sure that our emergency services and responders have a plan in place and that we've been able to test that with each other as well. So that when we come to hopefully never the real real thing, we've got a plan and there's plans in place to be able to deliver against it um, so that there is something that the community know that we've been practicing for. Our well, first thing we want to do is produce really a, a comprehensive, well thought out plan in terms of the uh, planning for Hikarangi Magnitude 9. The other which really is an aspirational goal at this point, but is to see strategic funding for Tairawhiti into the aspect of emergency management. It's, I wouldn't say we're about trying to resource to complete what would be quite a significant and catastrophic event, but it will certainly give us the lead in terms of what's a priority to consider uh, for strategic investment into the region. I've brought a number of my people that I believe that can uh, add value to the discussion today because actually you need, um, you need people's knowledge, skills, knowledge and experience to the table here. Um, this is not about being a leader and having all the answers, this is about getting the right people to the table and collectively drawing on their experiences and uh, nailing it. The biggest thing from this is our partner organisations being able to show their plans, to be able to work through those plans with each other, but really importantly to be able to test what our contingency plans, what are our business continuity plans, what do we do when we all lose power, where are we going to be, how are we going to operate, so that we're not assuming things between police, fire and emergency, St John's, that we have a plan in place, that we know how the other partner organisations are going to work, and then how can we work with each other best in those type of emergency situations. The 5th of March 2021, we had the three tsunami and earthquakes in one day, and seeing what played out on that day, and I guess the longer I've been in a role, getting a, a very deep understanding of what the science that has that's underlying for Hikarangi really highlighted that we have, and we do live, in a very tenuous part of the world. Um, now that has its latent in the sense that it's obviously not active, but on the back of the updated science released last year by GNS, which is a 26% chance in the next 50 years, uh, that was, is actually quite a considerable set of odds to take into account, particularly with the natural, uh, natural hazards scenario. This is really important. I think this has to be one of the greatest threats, unknown threats, as to when this might happen for our region. So it's really important for us to understand the science that underpins and informs us in terms of the planning that we might undertake. It's really important that we get a sense around what the risks are, um, how we need to mitigate those risks. Uh, and I think it's really important as a, as a region to come together, informed by the science, with our emergency partners to support our community to be prepared, as prepared as we can be. There's a lot we can do ourselves to prepare um, as a national society, for example, but the stronger relationships we have uh, with civil defence, for example, and other responding agencies um, really helps to um, formulate plans ahead of time and make us a lot more effective. My major concern is that this is going to be a catastrophic event. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be well underwater where I stand now. Um, the bridge behind me probably isn't going to be there. Um, people will find it very, very difficult to evacuate from um, the CBD and the low-lying areas near the beach. Um, and in terms of most things, it'll be a matter of survival. Look, the, if, if, if the worst case scenario were to happen uh, and, and the, the tsunami that would ensue from, 
from something from the Hikarangi Trench, um, it, you know, it, it could be quite devastating. So it's all about being ready for it. I think what Ben and the team have achieved here is is amazing. Um, the ability to get everybody together and have these conversations that need to be had um, because they do, and and often they're not. Um, and so when when you've got everyone in the room um, and everyone's having the same corridor, you can get quite a few nuggets out of that. Um, also, I think with regards to having everyone in the room, you start creating those lines of relationships. You know, everyone knows who's who within that sort of area and that kind of zone, um, and and it just makes sense because you know, regardless of whether it's hikarangi or it's just something in general, it's going to be these people that are working together to get through it, and so those relationships have kind of already been established, which is spot on. There's a whole what we do know, what we can probably expect is there will be a lot of chaos, um, there will be a lot of damage, um, there may well be fatalities and people injured. So trying to coordinate your priorities is going to be, is going to be of the essence. So, um, you know, we're having a workshop at the moment and trying to shape what that could look like and then we'll start working on a plan thereafter. Biggest concerns for us is if we have a severe earthquake, um, like in Japan, like in Bali, the impacts of that and what happens after the event and the immediate aftermath. We know that you know, where we're standing now, very likely to be inundated in a large wave. So a lot of debris, a lot of destruction, and then how do we keep our people safe who have survived, but then how do we look after people who have been less fortunate as well? And how do we have that in a coordinated response is really important for us. What I thought we should do is actually bring it back home and actually discuss what we actually learned from Tohoku um, in Japan because that was a, a critical, critical event that really changed our understanding of how we actually address um, tsunami risks within uh, the, the Hikarangi margin. Um, first one to stress, um, this uh, presentation contains a number of videos and some of those taken through during the March 2011 Tohoku earthquake um, may have content that may be disturbing to some people. So just to give you a warning about that. Our biggest tsunami will come from immediately offshore and if you can squint to the, um, uh, the right hand side there you can see all the offshore faults mapped by NEMA. Uh, NEMA, uh, NEWA in our area and that gives you an idea about how far offshore the Hikarangi margin is. It's close, but it's not that close. We're talking about um, um, quite a number of k's offshore, and that obviously drives how long it takes for that tsunami wave to, um, to arrive um, in Gisborne. Uh, the Tohoku event, we learnt a lot from that. The critical thing about it was it was um, both strong and long, and despite the um, intensity of the shaking, many buildings survived, and that provided a refuge to a lot of people for the tsunami that followed and a lot of people saved their lives, even if those buildings were not up to what we'd consider MBIE, uh, vertical evacuation um, standard. Now, I'd like you also now, if you can, if you want to, and if you don't want to, that's fine, get some stopwatches out, and um, when I click um, the next video, time how long the shaking goes on. Okay. <laughs>
2.30? Okay. That is what we call long, and it's also what we call strong. And um, there are certain things about that you'll notice. One is, firstly, the businessman right at the end buggering off and not helping anybody. Um, doing actually what people should be doing after that is actually evacuating as fast as possible. Um, so, um, and you also notice this is not going to be a quiet experience, this is going to be terrifying. Um, and so you know, that is something people often don't realise that you know, that first part, that shaking, is going to scare the hell out of you. And um, it's actually for some people that's actually going to affect how they respond and that's quite critical as well. So you saw the obvious things there. I don't know if you spotted it, but down on the ground floor there was a guy sitting there nonchalantly the entire way through, chilling out. Um, you know, one bit of behaviour, mum looking after the kids, protecting them. And it also wasn't one continuous shake at the same intensity, it came in waves. And so those are the type of things, and knowing when it finishes is actually quite critical because, you know, if it sort of eases off, it may come back a minute later and smack again. So if you're starting to evacuate then, that may be a wee bit too soon. But three to, three to five minutes, you should be out of there. Okay. Was that a bit um, sobering? Yeah. Tells you what we could experience here. Okay, so the next 30 minutes after that tsunami, tsunami arrives, is value, value, that's valuable. So you've got to spend those 30 minutes wisely. And that's a real critical thing. So these people here at Aapuni, um, they really got to sort of make sure that they actually get their act together and move. And there's another video here. We saw this in Jose's talk the other day. Um, this is before the earthquake, and the first thing just to emphasize is that as the earthquake occurs, we actually get subsidence on the poverty bay flat, which will add around about half a metre of water in that um, inland um, area, immediately um, inland of the sea, and so that will actually exacerbate the impact of that inundation coming from the tsunami. Okay, there's the subsidence, and then the timing, and the, the yellow is 10 metres. Multiple 
waves, and even right at the final extent of the tsunami inundation, you're looking at around about five metres of uh, water depth. Multiple waves coming in, and this is actually goes for six hours, but in actual fact, for 24 hours afterwards, you will be getting those multiple waves coming in. And you see the blue there is actually um, the sea receding before each wave comes in. Okay, now the other thing about it is that didn't really get discussed the other day, but it always seems very, very odd to people, lay people in particular, is the fact that the tsunami seems to finish in this remarkably straight line. Um, that's not real. Um, basically the guidelines say that we actually extend the tsunami inundation out um, to a known geographic feature that people will understand so that they know that once you get beyond that uh, point, um, then they're safe. But you know, it won't quite get there. Um, so that's um, a margin of safety, if you like. Um, so a key thing about that, that covers a lot of Gisborne except for the island of Kaiti. Okay. Critical thing about it, critical thing about it, do not wait for um, an, an official warning. It may not happen. Power may be out, um, cell connections may be out completely. Um, sirens, if they don't work, if you're relying on that, won't work. I think that first video shows you that you've got plenty of warning of this event, and when you feel that, you know what to do. Uh, walking or cycling is best. Um, this is actually based on um, some presentations we gave you to the, um, um, to, to the community multiple times. Um, have a designated route and practice it. Do not head to the coast to go surfing. Um, if you have kids in school, you should know that the school has an evacuation plan and trust that the school will act appropriately. Always have a grab bag of essential items. Expect aftershocks, and some of those will be quite large. Some of them can be nearly as large as the initial earthquake. If you do not have time to evacuate on land or you can't, get inside a sturdy building and get as high as possible. That building, if it survives the earthquake, may be damaged. If you can get up upstairs in that, um, you've got a better chance of surviving than being actually in the inundation. Um, generally speaking, recommendation is to avoid using your car. There will be traffic jams. Bridges may be structurally weakened or blocked, and roads may have uh, impassable ruptures. I don't think that applies to e-bikes. I'm pretty sure that will, they will work for a wee while. Okay, another video, and this shows you the danger of actually using your car to evacuate. The first time I realised a tsunami was going to hit was when I actually saw it myself. I looked in my rear view mirror and saw an even larger wave than the one that was in front of me. Dramatic footage has emerged of the Japanese tsunami in March. Shot by an onboard camera on a car belonging to Yumaroga, it shows the moment that waters flood a busy main road and the chaos that ensues. People were running out of their cars. I suppose that's about it. I think everybody was really panicking. It was incredibly quick. It probably only took about 10 or 20 seconds from the point when the water hit my car to the car being washed away. There's video of this woman getting washed away right before my eyes. At that time, I thought I was going to die. It was kind of strange, but I didn't really feel panicking myself. I was quite calm. OK, so I guess that shows you the pitfalls of actually using a, a car to try and evacuate. It will catch up with you. Um, and one thing about it, you would see there, you'll observe, is that the cars will really have really good buoyancy. Um, and probably the best thing to do is not get on the roof, um, but just stay with it. Um, you may have a slightly better chance of surviving from um, if you are stuck in that car. 
uh, rather than being on the roof where the next bit of rubble may knock it over, rotate over, and then you're in the, the water with all that rubble. Okay, <coughs> this is um, hopefully um, the um, animation of the evacuation that um, William showed the other day. And time going on, and you can see all the dots. This is night time, so people evacuating. And every white dot, remember that's every 100th person, just to give an idea. And you can see there, there are a particular choke points um, driven by where our, our bridges across the river are. This model here assumes, assumes that those bridges are actually intact. So you can see there, there is one big line of people going across um, Gladstone Road Bridge towards um, Kaiti, um, Tarangi Hill, others going across um, some of the other ones getting into safe zones. So we're now at 34 minutes, what is going on? The tsunami's already arrived. We've still got people in there. And remember, this is based on the bridges actually surviving. And what's interesting there, of course, is that people are overall making rational choices, the most direct line through to where um, they can evacuate. They're not using Ormond Road, for example, they're actually going across, um, which is actually a plus. This gives you an idea at night time, with bridges intact, um, after 25 minutes, by which time the tsunami has arrived, how many people are still in the city within the um, inundation zone. That's a lot. So we've got to expect that not everybody will make it. And because this is assuming the bridges survived, this is a best case type scenario. And when the model is run with those bridges cascading failures on those, um, that situation may be worse. And I know that MBI being um, officials from um, in the central government like to make sure that buildings um, that you vertically evacuate to meet their guidance. If we have something happen, I'm not sure that we're going to go through and try and flick through a manual to work out whether or not that building is actually sort of um, up to the specifications. If it has stood up, hasn't failed, um, and particularly if it's in a particular type of um, building, it is potentially likely to survive and gives you a better chance of surviving than other options. This is another video, hopefully. Okay, so um, in that instance there, in this um, fishing village in Japan, um, a lot of the really fragile buildings failed completely, 
Um, but even though they were damaged, some of these other buildings, like that one we see there, um, right next door to the sea, uh, because it could actually yield and have those panels um, that broke and allowed the water to go through it, um, actually survived, and that's quite important. So um, there is a piece of work where we will start needing to do to actually work out which of our buildings um, are likely to be able to survive that type of event. Okay. We could do with one of these at least. Okay, this is the last slide in this week's presentation. Um, key thing I really wanted to um, say here is that information will um, be scarce at the time. People will be speculating about what's going on. People's understanding of what will be going on will be based on what they hear or see on social media or some of those disaster movies. Um, and so a trusted source of information is vital. So no, you will not get a wave that goes over the top of these skyscrapers and no, you will not see a shark um, coming bearing down on you um, in the middle of a tsunami. At least that's probably more likely if you're worried about trying to get away as well. Um, okay, so that's the end of that presentation. Thank you.